Welcome to our next video. We're going to continue our discussion talking about friction. And in particular, in this lesson, we're going to be talking about uh, specialty devices like wedges and uh, friction on flat belts. So um, basically, to start with, wedges um, are a mechanism that is used to transfer an applied force in one direction into a much larger force in another direction, usually through the use of a slope or or, or an inclined plane of some sort, and that's kind of what we're looking at here. All right, so what we have is, if I take and put the end of the object, usually you got um, we have an object that, such as a wedge, this could be something like a door stop or, or some item like that that has a force P that's being applied to the end of it. And what this does is because of the, the behavior of this inclined ramp is as the block moves inward, it exerts a force onto this block that causes it to go upwards. So basically that's the redirection that we're talking about. Now, just like you've done with other objects that are uh, dealing with contact forces, because that's all this is, is a contact force problem, is um, we're going to draw free body diagrams of the two separate parts. Okay, so if we come in and we look at what we have happening here on this particular object, normally these wedges are very are, are smaller in size or weight compared to the object that they're trying to lift, and a lot of times we just neglect that. Uh, but you can include it into the free body diagrams as well. We also don't really consider tipping as a phenomenon on this. Uh, again, because we're assuming that the, the dimensions of this are very, very small. Okay, so that's why you won't see an, an H or anything like that. And I won't be too worried about where this normal is located. Okay, but, the, but other than that, we can draw the free body diagram in a similar fashion to what we've done before. All right, so I'm going to draw my wedge here. We're going to play our game with Ys again. W is the weight. I is in any internal forces that are revealed. So this will be the forces that come as a result of separating these objects. All right, and so what we have for the I on this is that as I push this block in, it wants to move in that direction. So that's the impending motion direction. Okay, and as we said, friction always opposes the impending motion of the object. So we have two friction planes that exist. We have one that's at the bottom of the wedge that's sitting on the surface, and I have another one that's acting at the interface between the wedge and the block that's up, up above. So if my impending motion of this wedge is to the right, then all of the horizontal components of the force need to be acting back to the left. So for the horizontal plane on the bottom, that's why F1 is acting over to the left. Okay, and then the le horizontal component of this guy acting at the sloped interface, you know, in order for it to be acting to the left, it needs to be acting up the plane, all right? So what we're doing is we're building a set of forces that look something like that for the incline guy. And then, so this would be the resulting F that you're, that you're seeing. Okay, so, so no major surprises, we can do this. Um, note that we have, you know, that the wedge of this thing is at some angle theta. Okay, that defines the slope of this. Okay, so those are our internals on the wedge. Um, S is a support reaction, so that could be the normal from, from the, the, the support and the ground, so that's my N1. Okay, we also pick up this, this extra reaction from, that's coming from the block up above that when I break this apart, there's a normal force that develops between the wedge above and, or sorry, the wedge below and the block above. Okay, and that will be oriented at some angle that's 90 degrees there. Okay, and then E is the external force. Clearly, that's the P that's acting on the block. All right, so once I have the wedge free body diagram drawn, because that's the piece that's moving, I can go and I can draw the free body diagram of the other piece. Okay, now for this particular one, we know that my N2, this normal that we put on the wedge, has to be met by an equal and opposite on the other side. So that's why this one is acting up. And again, it's 90 degrees from that surface. We're assuming the surfaces are parallel to each other. Okay, and because I had F2 going up the ramp on the wedge, it has to be going down the ramp on the block up at the top. All right, and then the last piece of it is to figure out, well, okay, what is this block doing when I drive the wedge under it? Well, clearly it's impending motion is acting in the upward direction. It wants to move up because of the way this block is being shoved underneath it. All right, so if that's the case, then the friction component, just like we did with the lower piece, friction has to be opposing impending motion. Okay, so that's why this friction force is down. Okay, this is the friction force between the wall and, um, and the block. Okay, and then I pick up the normal from the wall. As this thing gets knocked into the wall, the wall is pushing back. Okay, but then I have a downward friction force here, and then notice that the 
component of this guy is still downward. So we're still following and obeying that rule. Okay, even though I built this F off of what was happening on the block, it still works, that basic logic. And then for good measure, I put the weight, which would be acting at the center end of the block on this one as well. Now again, we're not worried about tipping or anything like that in this case, um, but just kind of how do we construct this in these, these interface forces that have to exist between everything that we're doing. All right, so now that we have the basics of how a wedge works, it kind of brings us to one of our special uh, special topics is what we call self-locking wedges. Now, imagine a scenario where I have a block that's sitting on a step here, and then under the end of it, I place a wedge under the end of this corner here. Obviously, we know that if there were no friction, putting this weight down here would thrust this wedge out. Okay, but because of friction, I can basically hammer a wedge under this thing, and if it's designed right, the friction force that develops at this interface at the bottom of the wedge never overcomes the sliding limit, that F max value. Right? And so I would actually have to apply a load P in order to pull the wedge back out. And that's what we call a self-locking wedge. So one of the things that we can do on this is try to figure out, well, how much of a load P is needed to pull this thing free. All right? So for the basic example, I've got a couple of numbers here that we'll kind of kind of work through on this okay so the first thing is, is we're going to assume that the block there is no slippage at a okay meaning that that way this you know if i go to pull the wedge it doesn't pull the block with it okay so we're going to assume that this is kind of stationary kind of holding the block in place all right um the next thing that we have is is that the uh, coefficient of static friction at the interface at b which is this point at the corner is going to be equal to 0 0.3 and then the mass of the block itself is 500 kilograms and what we want to find is the force p to be able to pull this wedge out, okay, what it would take in order to overcome friction on this. All right, so just like we did before, we're going to take a look at the free body diagrams, and so we're going to draw both of them. And again, remember, it's the wedge that's the moving part, okay, and that's the one that you start with on the impending motion. So for us, what we have is we have this wedge stationary as such, and just like we had in the previous example, I'm going to have the impending motion is going to be to the right because that's the direction this force is going to pull this thing when the time comes. So the friction force has to be opposing this, and there are two of them. There's the one at the bottom of the wedge, which is this guy, and there's the one at the um, interface, which will be uh, have a horizontal component that's also opposing the impending motion. So that's why it's acting down, down the slope. Now, we're going to kind of make an assumption here that the friction, okay, at the bottom of this thing, F of C, is going to be equal to, or is uh, greater than or equal to F C max, okay? And that's the sliding criterion, that logic check that we do on this, all right? So when I do that, that guy ends up being the 0 0.3 N times C that you see shown in the diagram, all right? So this is the actual F max limit on this because in order to pull this out I have to set this guy greater than or equal to this so we're going to set it equal to the lower bound on that okay and then just like that at um, at interface of B we also have the static coefficient of 0.3 times the normal force between those which in this case is the normal that NB value and it's acting perpendicular to the wedge and so that's how we start to kind of work our way through this. So that's the free body diagram of the wedge. The free body diagram of the block is a little bit more complicated. Okay, the first thing that we know is, is we know that the friction force will flip, so it's acting up, and it's going to be at whatever this angle is. I think it's 7 degrees was the limit in the problem. All right, it's kind of hard to see, but that's a 7 degrees. So we could say, you know, theta equals 7 degrees. And so here's our 7, okay, and then we know that for this that the friction force is going to here is going to be opposite the one that's here so now it's acting up at 0 0.3 and b and it's acting at that angle and then the normal is going to be acting perpendicular to that line all right and so this is also a seven degree line right there okay and so then the nb will be that's the orientation of nb on both pictures and again it was down on the wedge here so it's up on the block here Okay, and then the support condition at this other support is a little bit more complex, and then I have FA acting to the left and NA acting up. Okay, and again, that was because we assumed that, it was, that there was no slippage on this, so there has to be a force to hold it horizontally, and so that's what this guy is. We don't know what the coefficient of friction is. We don't know if it's you know, nailed in place or glued or whatever, but that's our basic, um, our basic setup. And then, of course, the self-weight, which in this case is going to be 4,905 newtons, you know, acting downward. Okay, all right. So here's what we're going to do. To be able to solve this, to be able to figure out the wedge mechanics, I've got to find NB. 
So if I look at my free body diagram on this, okay, if I sum moments at A, that's the logical choice because I don't know exactly what's going on over here. I don't know the coefficient of friction. I don't know the normals or anything. So I'm going to sum moments at A and knock both of those guys out of the equation. And then with that, I can come in and start to figure out the rest of my information. Now, one dimension that I left off on this was the dimension of the block is one meter. So I know that if this block is uniformly distributed in its mass, that this will be half of that value or 0 0.5 meters. Okay, and then that this force here is 0 0.1 meters. And with that, I have everything I need to be able to start solving for stuff. So the first thing we do is we try to find NB. All right, and that's the equation that we're going to do. So we're going to sum moments at A to knock out these two unknowns. And then I don't care if it's sliding or the limit or not. It, I'm just summing moments to get the static value. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the 4905 newtons times 0 0.5. Relative to this point, this guy is going clockwise, and we assume counterclockwise positive here. So that's why that's a negative times the 0.5. Got it. Okay, and then I'm going to take my NB and I need the vertical component of that, which is the cosine of seven degrees times NB, and that's multiplied by one meter. And I just saw that I wrote that wrong. Okay, that should be a one meter there. Okay, and that's, so that's that value. And then, but I also pick up, and this is where it gets a little confusing, is I also pick up the vertical component of this guy. So I'm gonna take 0 0.3 times NB times the sine of seven degrees, that gets me the vertical and that too is multiplied by one meter. So that's the vertical component of this. Okay, now again, anytime I break these into components, I have to go to both pieces of it. So if my, you know, if my force is this way and I pick up this piece and I decide to use that one, then I also have to use this one. Okay, so we use the vertical, I got to account for this. Well, in both cases of this, that horizontal is acting through this corner and so that's this line and then so the horizontal of this guy and the horizontal of this guy are both on this line and that line acts through a so it's perpendicular distance is zero so i don't even need to consider it i'm going to leave you know just i'm not even going to bother writing it into the equation so once i do that all of this is solvable and i can solve for nb being 2383 newtons on those okay so now i can take now that i have nb i now have this guy which gives me this guy now all I need to know is figure out, well, what's my NC value? And then with that, I can get P. So we're going to play with the wedge. Okay, now one of the things about wedges is you really only have two equations. I can only do sum of forces because we don't know the dimensions. And again, we said usually these dimensions are so small that there's next to no moment and we're not worried about tipping on these. But if I come down and I look at the wedge, I can write the forces Y and the forces X equations off of this picture here. So first thing I'm going to do is forces X. And so that's going to be my 2383.1 newtons, that's my NB, okay, and I'm gonna multiply that by the sine of seven degrees, so that's the horizontal component of that guy, and then I'm gonna subtract off minus 0 0.3 times NB, the 20, 2383.1 newtons, and then this guy, I'm taking the cosine of that horizontal piece, um, so cosine of seven degrees, and then plus P, so, if I look at that, so this is a plus, I have a minus here and a plus here, okay, and then minus the 0 0.3 times nc all equal to zero. And so I end up with an expression now on that sum of forces x equation that has two unknowns. It has p and it has nc. All right, now let's go look at the y direction. So for the y direction on this, I'm going to take the vertical component of nb, so that's nb times the cosine of seven degrees, so that's this first term here, okay? And then I have the 0 0.3 times NB times the sine of seven degrees, that's this term, okay? And again, NB is 20, 2383, okay? And then plus NC all equal to zero. So this one I can solve for the NC value, and when I do that, NC becomes 2452.5 newtons, okay? And then if NC is 24. 52.5 newtons, I can now plug this back into the sum of forces in the x equation. All right, and that gets me a P of 1,155 newtons taken to pull this thing out. Okay, and so what this means though is, is that an interesting, interesting thing shows up, okay? P was a positive value on here. We had a positive value here, which means that the positive that I drew on the free body diagram was correct, meaning that in order to get this wedge to come free, 
I have to pull on the force of this thing. Okay, that this thing, that it takes extra force to pull this out because the friction values are so high. Okay, and so when I do that, one of the things that we can notice on this is that if, you know, and I look at the coefficient that we had for the static friction, it was 0.3. It's a pretty high value. So the, you know, if this had been something smaller or it had been lubricated or it had been almost zero on this, then this thing would have wanted to move out and P would have come out as a negative value by looking at this equation, right? If I knock both of these terms out of the way, you know, because they're, the coefficient is fairly small, this guy becomes negative, which would imply that my picture is backwards, which would mean that I would have to put a force on it to hold it in place. So the sign of this tells me everything I need to know about the wedge. So the fact that this wedge is a positive value on that force tells me that this is a self-locking mechanism, that it will not shoot itself out when I put a weight on it uh, because the P is positive, okay, which means that, again, what I'm assuming was pulling on it on that, all right? So, you know, if the, the P had been equal to zero, you know, you know um, or had been some lesser value, then it's not a self-locking self -locking wedge. So that's one of the, the cases where these things, it's kind of interesting and some assumptions that can be made. So we're, you know, again, it's very, very basic. It's just drawing the free body diagrams like we've been doing, but now applying some logic and working through both sides of both pieces. The trick on this, again, is I've got to get that normal force from the weight onto the wedge. Okay, and then once I have that, I can start to unravel what's going on with that. All right, so that's our wedges situation. Okay, all right. The next topic that we have that we want to look at then is going to be friction that's being applied to flat belts or even to surfaces of pulleys. Okay, so early on, remember what these, these belts are doing is they are redirecting they're redirecting our forces. And early on, we said for all pulleys that T1 was always equal to T2. That, you know, this was my pulley, that's T1, this was T2, and that was if there was no friction. But the reality is, is that friction exists on this. And so now we've got to kind of figure out, well, how can I account for all of this? And so the basic mechanism is this. We're going to take a, a belt or a cable or a rope or a pulley going over the edge of a system, okay, and I'm going to call this side T2, or I'm going to call this side T1, and we're going to define it such that T2 is greater than T1, okay, that I'm pulling on it, and that the impending motion of this belt is wanting to trace itself kind of up and over and then back to the left. You can see that dotted line here. That's my impending motion direction, okay. Now, what happens is, is that the impending motion is now relative to the surface, It's no longer, which is what we saw before, okay, but in this case, that surface is now this arc length, of the tangent point. So we have a tangent point here and a tangent point here and everywhere in between there's friction that's being tied into this. Now the thing that makes this a little bit more complex is that we know that this overall friction value has to be related to the normal as this belt wants to move past, uh, slide past along that surface, right? But the thing that makes it more complicated is, is that the normal is no longer the same value everywhere. It's actually kind of a distributed load, if you will, and even the angle is different. So it's a really complex distribution with the higher end of the normal being closer to the higher load and a little bit less on this back end, right? And so then every one of these little normals produces a, a you know, kind of an, a finite friction value that changes also along the length of it. And so we can kind of look at and kind of define that for any particular slice of this, that this normal is now a function of its angular position measured relative to here. So if I start here and call this as my angle is zero, then this is my angle of theta, okay? And that's known as the wrap angle. Okay, and so the amount of friction is directly proportional to the amount of the wrap angle. And that should make sense, right? If I take this rope and I wrap it nine times around this thing, it should have a whole lot larger value than if I have one that's just barely making contact. And that's the idea. So not only is the normal a function of theta, if the normal is a function of theta, then clearly the friction is also a function of theta. Okay, and so there's this strange distribution. Now, as engineers, we don't like to go through and try to solve for this and have to worry about all of these different values. What we're going to do is we're going to turn this kind of into an average or a total combined value, which is going to be the summation of all of these. And that relationship looks something like what I'm showing here, that the tension at location 2 is equal to the tension at 1 times 
this exponential e raised to mu times beta, okay? And so that's the basic functionality. Now, if you look at this for frictionless, if mu was equal to zero, then what happens? T2 becomes T1, and that's exactly what we had said before. So here's my T2, and there's my T1. So this is the general equation that works for all cases, friction and non-frictionless. It's just now, this one now accounts for the value of that friction value. So we made this assumption early, but this is the truth of what's really going on. All right, so the way that you define these terms are that T1 opposes the direction of the belt motion. All right, so we said that if we're pulling with T2 a larger force, this belt is moving down and to the left, and T1 is the one that's fighting you. It's on the back side. So that's our T1. T2 then is the one that's opposite of T, T2. So this is in the direction of the belt motion. Okay, and then the mu then is the coefficient of friction that exists between the belt and that contact surface right along here. All right, so that's the mu that we have. Okay. And then if it's static, we use mu s. If it's already moving, then we're using mu k. So static or dynamic will both work. The other piece then is beta, okay? And this is the angle of the belt to the surface contact, okay? And this is always measured in radians, so you got to kind of watch your, watch your units on this. But that's the angle that exists between here and here. There's two tangent points where the belt first enters contact and then where it leaves coming out the other side. That angle in between there is beta, all right? And so if we look at our picture, we're kind of looking at something that looks like this, and it's this guy right here. All right, and that's my beta value. Okay, and it's measured in radians on this. All right, so let's try one real quick. I mean, it's a very simple formula. We'll take a system, and we're going to take a system of pulleys on this that has the following information. Okay, I've got three pulleys with a single belt that wraps around it, or a cable, or, or whatever you want to call it. Okay, it has a mass M over on the right side measuring 500 newtons, it's acting straight down and then it makes contact with pulley C and then it wraps around to a point and then it takes off and goes tangent down to A and then it goes up to B and then wraps around and then I'm holding it on force T and we wanna find out how much force T is required to hold up this belt. Okay, now the things that we know, uh, some of the, the, to make this problem a little more interesting is we're gonna say that A is free to rotate. Okay, and whenever you see that, Free to rotate basically means that mu A is equal to zero. Okay, that there is no friction, it can do whatever it wants. B and C, however, have a static coefficient of 0 0.25. Okay, and what we want to find is we want to find the largest mass that can be lifted on this system. All right, so all we're going to do is just like with any pulley problem, is we're going to come in and we're going to look at every pulley individually. Okay, so the maximum tension in the belt on this is going to be, we said, was listed as... 500 newtons, okay, that's the allowable limit. You know, maybe if I go over this, the belt breaks or something. So that maximum always occurs on the T2 side. So this is a T2. All right, all right so all we're gonna do is we're gonna move one pulley at a time. All right, so if I look at, we're gonna start off with a free body diagram for pulley B. So we have 500 down, that was my T2. Okay, and then my T1 on the back side of this thing, as it wraps from here, to here is going to be equal to our our wrap angle so our beta goes from here to here okay now if we look at this okay because this is basically all the belts are given as being at 45 degrees that means that from here to here is 135 degrees okay and 135 degrees measured in radians is 3 fourths pi radians Okay, recalling, of course, that 180 degrees is pi and 90 degrees is pi over 2. Okay, so with that, I can plug into my formula. And the, the hardest part is just getting your T2s and T1s squared away here. So I'm going to put 500 newtons in for T2. T1 is unknown. E to my friction value of 0.25 times 3 fourths of pi. And I run the math. I find out that T1 is 277.4 newtons. All right, so that coefficient of friction with that wrap angle takes what was 500 newtons and knocks it down to 277.4. Okay, so that's a pretty significant drop off on that. All right, so that will get me that one. Now I go to, and I basically just kind of keep marching along because I'm trying to figure out what is that mass value. So, so that gets me to here. So now I know that the tension in this, the limit is 277.4 newtons. All right, because if I exceed that, then I will go over 500 here and I will break the belt there.
right. All right, so we can kind of continue on. Problem is very pretty basic after this. All right, if we go and we look at at B or sorry at A, you know this is 45 degrees. This is 45 degrees. Okay. Now again, this belt because of the way things are being pulled, we're looking at a belt direction of that. So that makes this guy T2 and this guy T1. So now, this was T2, this is that 277.4. On the pulley at B, it was a T1 value, but now it becomes the driver going into pulley A. So this is my T2. Now, because we said this was frictionless, we know that this value has to be equal to this. This guy is 277.4 Newtons on that side. Okay, so we can kind of move our way through. Now, just keep on marching along. So now that was my T1 there. Now I move down to, to the last pulley. And so we know that from here to here, that's 45 degrees. And so now this becomes my driver because, again, the whole system is wanting to move that way. All right, so then T2 is on this side. T1 is on that side. And I play the same game on this. And so if that's my contact and that's my contact with that angle on this, then I know that again, this is 135. Now it's kind of interesting to note that if we kind of look at what's happening, we know that that's 90 degrees, right? And so what that means is it means that if this is 45, then that's the same angle there. And so it's 180 from here all the way around minus 45. That's where I'm getting the 135 number. Okay. All right. So then we've got everything that we need. 277.4 is equal to T1 is equal to E times 0 0.25 and then again three quarters of a pi in radians. Okay, and that gets me to a T1 of 153.9 newtons. Okay, and so that becomes this guy, 153.9 9 newtons. Okay, now we were being asked to find what the biggest mass that could be lifted is. So then the last picture is going to be this guy. Okay, and so if this is T1 here, then this has to be T1 of 153.9 newtons. And then that force is balanced by the weight, which is mass times gravity. Okay, and so if I do sum of forces in the Y, okay, all that, then we know that T1 is going to be end up being equal to W, okay, which is equal to M times G. So then I can solve for the mass of this thing as being my T1 value divided by G. All right, so I'm going to take my 153.9. I'm going to divide it by my, my SI units for gravity, 9.81 meters per second squared. And that's going to tell me that the largest mass that I can lift on this is going to be 15.7. That's a decimal there. 0.7 kilograms that can be lifted without breaking the belt on the other side. And that's all there is to being able to handle friction on these, uh, on these frictionless belts or frictionless pulley or, you know, I'm sorry, for friction belts or friction pulley systems, all right? It's just that one extra little equation of T2 equal to T1 times E mu times beta. That's the only difference that I have to add. So I can do that on any friction pulley. Now, again, on pulleys, remember, there are other things that are causing friction, not just the belt. This is the measure of the belt slipping past the surface. You know, if this were a real pulley, I could have friction in the bearings, and there could be, you know, any number of other factors that are affecting it. Um, th this might be like the old Indiana Jones, you know, remember how he had the, the rod and he takes the whip, you know, this is an awesome picture, I know, and you know, he whipped it over here and then this thing wrapped around on that, you know, how many times is it wrapped to, in order to, to hold his weight up, you know, I've used that problem as an example, you know, how many times does that whip have to wrap around in order to be able to, to hold a weight once these, he tries to swing across. But that's all there is to it is I just have to know basically how many times does it wrap and that's that wrap angle value that's happening there. So so that's the, the second of our, our, our kind of frictional topics for this lesson. So, so at this point I think we're going to go ahead and stop there. Um, as always, um, if you um, leave us some feedback down in the comments below letting us know uh, what we can do better, what you liked, what you didn't like. Um, please be sure to like and subscribe to the channel and we'll like I say as we always say try to keep these keep these um, presentations and these lessons uh, coming as, as much as we can. Okay, so as always, um, hope you all have a, a wonderful evening and happy engineering. Thanks.